This lecture will survey the types of criticisms that apply to biblical interpretation. It's also an overview of some of the terminology that's connected with it. Historical or higher criticism. The first one is historical criticism. Uh, it's referred to as higher criticism. It's really a basic approach to the study of any ancient document in one's attempt to determine the authenticity of what's, what's it's recording, an attempt to reconstruct the situation that produced that document. The German term Sitzenleben, or life setting, is the word that most often is used in uh, academic literature to talk about that situation of where, where the document was uh, uh, written, why was it written, uh, to whom was it written, what was their situation that uh, address those issues. It involves exploring questions such as authorship, uh, when it was written, the place of origin, under what circumstances, what was the occasion of the writing. So it explores the purpose for which it was written as well. This term, Sitzenleben, also involves the attempt to de detect any underlying literary sources that may have been used in writing the text, and whether the text was a literary unit, that is, was the text presented in its full form and for the Bible, that would be its full canonical form. The one that we see in the Bible as a single document, one writing or was it put together as a patchwork made up of multiple woven together writings. Second criticism we'll look at is called textual criticism, sometimes referred to as lower criticism, to distinguish it from higher criticism. This attempts to determine the, the or, original text of a writing in our case, uh, more particularly a particular New Testament book, from the manuscripts that are avail available. So textual criticism begins by collecting, collating, comparing all extent existing manuscripts of giving writing. Uh, it evaluates those manuscripts in terms of what kind of changes or variations exist between the handwritten manuscripts. There are principles and methods that are applied to the manuscripts to determine what's the most likely original form. We call the original text the autograph, the autographa, or the autograph. Uh, now it's true that as far as the Bible is concerned we have no autographs. However, we have far more ancient manuscripts than any other literary work. We have more than 5,500 Greek manuscripts, so we're able to compare, collate these variations or textual variations and change uh, changes into different categories and work our way back toward the autograph, the original form of the writing. Let's take a look with, uh, with an illustration. Let's say X is the top, is the autograph. Say the book of Galatians from the original. There's three copies of these. Then more copies of those from even more copies. Each copyist has certain characteristics, and those are called transcriptural characteristics. Handwriting styles, abbreviations, symbols they may have lived, left in the margins. Uh, the use of particular words or expressions, spelling changes, subtle changes in grammar, syntax, all those kinds of things. Now, by comparing those characteristics between manuscripts, scholars can determine if a group of manuscripts are related, that is, if they came from the same source. Manuscripts that uh, bear similar characteristics are called a family. Uh, and if you compare manuscripts from very large groups, and they will all come from a particular geographical region, we call that group a text type. They would have a smaller number of characteristics because you're dealing with a much larger group of manuscripts, but there would still be a distinct type of text. Uh, the diagram on the far right shows that the goal is comparing, uh, is to recreate the autograph in what is called the text. So the text is the result of using textual criticism to reproduce the original autograph. Um, and from that text, then you translate into all the different languages of the world the various versions of the Bible. I found this graphic helpful as an overview of the different critical methodologies. Uh, we will get into more of this detail later. Uh, actually, what we have is the original events played out by the words of God, say, the life of Jesus. Oral traditions after, you know, he died in around, let's just do average dates, around 30 AD. And the first written document uh, about him uh, for the Gospels would be, uh, some say as early as 45 AD. Others put him around in the 60s. Uh, 
Uh, some uh, li liberal scholars put them in the, after 70 A.D. and to, even into 110 A.D. But anyway, that oral period between the actual events and the um, time the first gospel was written is called the oral period. And so in that oral period, there may have been sources that were developed. And from that point, uh, finally, the uh, author of the New Testament puts it down, the inspired written autograph. Then that that uh, autograph was copied and in, in, uh, went into different areas, all those copies uh, that we saw in the last slide. And that's what textual criticism is all about, lower criticism. In higher criticism or historical criticism, there's two major approaches. There's the diachronic and the synchronic. Diachronic through time, synchronic, the holistic approach. Uh, diachronic is to, uh, looks at source criticism, what sources the uh, biblical writers used. Form criticism, looking at the various uh, oral and literary forms that were part of their culture. And then there's tradition criticism, uh, adaptations to different situations over time. Uh, the, the holistic approach is what, where we are today mostly. It's text-centered, it's objective. Uh, there's redaction criticism that's kind of a theological approach to scripture and a rhetorical criticism that's analysis of the literary devices and the structure of script, uh, scripture. Uh, and then there's the uh, subjective approach that you find more and more in the liberal schools, and it's the reader response criticism, the new hermeneutic of deconstruction, uh, contextualization, liberation theology, and those kinds of things. Source criticism, uh, another name, literary source criticism. It, it's an attempt to find what is likely literary sources upon which the biblical books are based. Some literary sources might be miracle stories, passing narratives, speeches, or discourses. Now, we don't have the documents themselves, but by looking, for example, at the Gospels, we can hypothesize that there were a collection of certain types of material. Some of this must have been written down, and we could say these pr provided sources for the evangelists. And we know from Luke's own words in chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, that Luke had written sources at his disposal and used them in the production of his gospel. So a question related to source criticism is, would there be Aramaic gospels from which our canonical Greek gospels came? It's interesting that although we have no Aramaic gospel manuscript, we do have the testimony of surly, uh, several early church fathers who said, for example, that Mark's, uh, Matthew's gospel was the first gospel written, and it was written in the Hebrew tongue. Uh, people have been looking for those, but never found them. They have no evidence of um, of Matthew's gospel in any Aramaic. But we can look at Matthew's gospel in Greek and see Aramaic structures, the use of Aramaic words, Aramaisms. Whether or not uh, they were in a Aramaic uh, gospel uh, originally, we don't have any absolute proof because we haven't found them. But we do have some testimonies. Now, also that testimony by Papias could be interpreted as being simply notes that Matthew took while Jesus taught. That was a very common practice of disciples in that day, of rabbis, follow, uh, that their, their disciples, their followers, would, would actually take notes of what they said. So the, the question is, can source criticism include oral traditions? Yes, it can. If that tradition is viewed as a single collection, such as the parables of Jesus, or the wisdom saying, sayings of Jesus, or the I am sayings of Jesus in the Gospel of John. Source criticism is used to ask questions about the faith community as well that developed these sources. So it's another window into the New Testament world. Particular faith communities that develop these sources, for example, commentaries on the Gospel of John, will talk about the Johannian community that had a need to save the material related to the sign source that we find the seven signs in the Gospel of John. The miracles Jesus did are called signs in John's Gospel. Form of glacita or form criticism. It's interesting that criti criticism was developed in the wake of a sense of incompleteness about source criticism. There were gaps, gaps that they wanted to fill in. So form critics seek to get behind the written source of, 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 of the Bible to a pre-literary oral tradition. 
So form criticism is very much uh, interested in the oral tradition. They are not looking for hard copies or written sources, but speculating as to what was behind the written sources in oral tradition. Well, how is that done? How do you do that? Well, the assumption is, for a long period of time, perhaps 40 years or more, the church passed on exclusively oral preaching, oral traditions, before anything was written down for posterity. This is very dubious because Luke mentions that he had written sources at his disposal in the first century when he wrote the gospel. And the church father Papias says Matthew wrote down notes in Aramaic when Jesus taught. He he thought he wrote down uh, the logia, he, Papias calls it, the logia of Jesus. That's, that's the sayings or words or messages of Jesus. No doubt he had those sources at his disposal, his own notes. It works to identify and isolate, though, forms in the written sources. And this is valuable because it's looking at literary forms, identifying genres and subgenres, uh, various kinds of, uh, of genres uh, extant at the time of the first century when those kinds of things were done. And, and that's an evalu valuable uh, literary investigation. And the question they ask along these literary forms is what's going on in the early church that would have called on them to produce these forms. Notice what it is. This is speculation that the early church produced the literary forms out of the oral forms, and the oral forms re re were reflecting the needs of the faith community, the early church. So, for example, the I am sayings. They would say that before they were ever written down, people remembered, recalled, and recited them, perhaps from the need to define their Christology, a need to defend Jesus as the Son of God and to attach Jesus' authority to Yahweh of the Old Testament, where in Exodus 3, God reveals himself as the I Am. So, form criticism then becomes another way to look at what's there, an attempt to get behind what is the written, uh, what is written to the life of the church, the sits in Laban. Uh, what might have produce that oral tradition behind the written sources. So uh, let me give you something that is of relevance here. In Mark's gospel, there's a number of passages that indicate that Jesus deliberately tried to downplay his notoriety. Um, to, uh, uh, to this downplay of his notoriety and discourage others from announcing his true identity, Jesus often says, tell no one, but go and do something. Uh, the, so the most he, motif is referred to as the, quote, messianic secret. Forum critics would attempt to construct a scenario in the church that would call for this motif. For example, they might postulate it this way. An errant Christology had evolved in the church that looked at Jesus as little more than a Greco-Roman divine man, a theos and an heir, a wonder worker. And they were attempting to correct this association. They needed a way to do that. So that they developed this messianic secret where Jesus is revealed as being the Messiah. He is revealed as being the divine son, yet he is not publicizing it. He's downplaying his true identity. Now, how does this work out? It seems that form critics would say that the early church was writing the gospel and inserting this material into the gospel in such a way as to have Jesus deny this association with the divinity because it looked too much like the Greco-Roman divine wanderer, uh, 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 divine man myth, and that the real burden of the gospel was to point out his redemptive mission. The Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many, Mark 10, 45. So they need to emphasize the purpose of his coming, not his identity. So form criticism, as you can tell, is a good part of speculation behind the motivation of the early church, not necessarily Jesus, but the motivation of the early church to produce these sayings. And some would say to read them back into the mouth of Jesus in order to meet a specific need current in the church in the first century. So they see the gospel material as the creativity of the early church, not a reflection of what was actually historically said by Jesus. Well, why? To meet a specific need in the church. Not the needs of people or the audience Jesus was originally address, addressing. Tradition crit criticism, uh, the study of historical process of development in the form, meaning, and usage of words. So it's narrower. It's not looking at literary forms, but at isolated sayings or words, asking what's going on. Why are these 
titles for Jesus being preserved and passed down. Christological titles like the Son of Man or the Wisdom, I Am, or, or parables even. Uh, even blocks of material like conflict stories, passion narratives, and so forth. And then later incorporated into the New Testament. And they're looking at how this material that was being passed on was undergoing certain changes. This would, could include both written and oral traditions. Note, tradition usually refers to the substance of the church's teaching, which has been preserved and passed down. But tradition criticism looks more at the way or the form in which it was passed down. So, continuing tradition criticism, whereas form criticism looked at the literary form, Tradition criticism look at the New Testament data to detect any development, change, diversity of theological perspective. It looks to explain the differences in similar sayings, how those differences are there in the first place, and why those subtle minor, minor differences may have occurred. For example, I consider a legitimate use of tradition criticism is why some writers use the kingdom of God and others the kingdom of heaven, and why do some use son of man and others son of God. So why does Matthew use kingdom of heaven, where other evangelists use kingdom of God? In the same passage, same context, same everything. They were asking that in a way of finding out what the church was thinking and what the church was confronted with. Now, of course, the son of uh, heaven, the kingdom of heaven, because uh, it was writing, Matthew's writing to a Jewish audience, and they want to not use the word uh, Yahweh or God in any way. They want to uh, even have like a ter as a substitute, heaven or Hashem, the name. So a Jew usually says Hashem, the name, to refer to God rather than actually Yahweh. And uh, so, but Luke, uh, you know, he's writing Greeks. They don't care if he uses son of God or seven, son of, uh, you know, kingdom of God. For, him, for them, it makes no difference. So, redaction criticism. Now, we're, this redactional classita uh, method uh, focuses on the theological motivations of the writers. Uh, how is it done? Well, by analyzing the editorial compositional techniques and interpretation employed by, by that writer in shaping and framing the tradition at hand. So they look at the differences in the Gospels, particularly the literary scenes between blocks of material, uh, and they, they say why these differences and what theology of the evangelist is being emphasized by these differences. What is he trying to get at? Now, this is uh, the definition provided by Richard Sulin, quote, in shaping and framing the written or oral tradition, and they believed that the evangelists were theologians in their own right. They were handing down traditions, some written, some oral. They shaped it as they saw fit in order to follow through with a theological agenda. Now, evangelicals recognize the, the legitimacy of form criticism, but with one caveat. They see the evangelists as theologians, but not to the extent that they invent or create material out of thin air, not to the extent they construct the historical settings for events pro quo, that is, instead of that, uh, or that they invented sayings that were never spoken by Jesus and put them into the mouth of Jesus. Now, radical liberal redaction critics view the gospel as faith documents and not as reliable expressions of what was actually done or said. Charts that uh, it also charts the activity of biblical authors in shaping, modifying, and in some cases in creating material for the final written product. Uh, product. Uh, the, uh, the the product is viewed as reflecting the theological and literary art of the author. He's not just a scribe. He is a creative redact redactor, uh, taking the materials that he has and reworking them into a story, limited to minor changes of wording, which are still faithful to authorial intent, but reflects the, uh, the, the uh, gospel writer's theological perspective. Uh, let me give you an example of that. Okay, uh, Matthew seven eleven. If you then go through, uh, you though being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So this parallel statement in Luke eleven thirteen. Then if you if then though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, 
how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So notice the change. The occasion seems to be the same. The historical setting seems to be similar. So why the change in words? Is Matthew lying? Is Luke lying? Did one write the true words of Jesus, the other not? I don't think it's the either or in this case. And you'll still be able to uphold the legitimacy of what's being taught. Here it looks as if Luke expresses his belief that the Holy Spirit is the key or instrumental agent who dispenses all good gifts given to the New Testament uh, children of God. And this is consistent with Luke's emphasis throughout the gospel on the Holy Spirit. So does this change uh, change the essence or the gist of what Jesus was teaching? The change dovetails with Luke's pneumatology that emphasizes the Holy Spirit as the mediator of much of what Jesus came to do in redemption. That is, the good things, according to Matthew. Let's turn to another approach, a methodological discipline known as rhetorical criticism. Uh, what is rhetorical criticism all about? Remember that the queen of the sciences of the first century was rhetoric. The study involved learning different patterns or structures for making presentations, mostly oral speeches, but also written, in order to accomplish a particular goal or purpose, such as persuading an audience to do something. Well, rhetorical criticism seeks to supplement form criticism by looking at the structural patterns used in documents. They observe the author's literary artistry, the structural patterns within literary units, such as paragraphs, segments, sections, pericopes, divisions within books. So scholars study Greco-Roman rhetoric to learn the kinds of patterns and structures common in literature and then look for those kinds of patterns in New Testament books. Uh, very much, much uh, an emphasis today by scholars. It looks at literary devices, chiasms, parallelisms, repetitions, inclusios, ellipsis, etc. Uh, it helps to interpret a work as a unified whole. We'll be mentioning some of these devices as we go through the content of New Testament books. By the way, an excellent resource for that list is given uh, gives New Testament examples of literary devices and Bullinger's Figures of Speeches in the Bible, a massive tome uh, worth your time. It seeks to trace the flow of thought of an author uh, through the rhetorical structures and devices located in his work. Now, what is listed um, the, uh, above are literary devices within a book. But you can analyze the entire book as being a certain kind of rhetorical structure. Each type of li rhetorical liter literary uh, structure, uh, for example, an apologia, a rhetorical defense, an epideictic, or rhetorical persuasion, like maybe perhaps the book of Galatians falls in between both of those, or a friendship letter, for example, a contractual exhortation like a Philemon. So it looks at both the small devices and the mega devices within uh, with a, uh, looking at books. Uh, an example of this um, approach might be, for example, uh, looking at Greco-Roman rhetoric or epistolography. Uh, Galatians is a Greco-Roman epidetic, apologetic letter of persuasion. Uh, this is done very uh, has very various ones like Han. Ditzer Betts, Commentary on Galatians, and Ben Witherington's uh, Commentary, Grace in Galatia, uh, a Commentary on Paul's Letter to the Galatians, and Bernard Hungerford's uh, Brimesmead, Galatians, Dialogical Response to Opponents. It's a dissertation series of the Society of Biblical Literature. All of these argue from Greco-Roman rhetoric that Paul is intentionally following a literary pattern, the epidetic, that it it uh, has its own characteristic, the ap ap apologetic letter of persuasion. And then rhetorical criticism would look at the New Testament author's uh, use of these devices. Uh, for example, the five narrative panels and acts, each ending with a summary growth statement, catchphrase. I use this in the, doing the timeline of the New Testament under that you uh, contributed to under module one to divide the book of Acts into panels. This is a rhetorical critical analysis of Acts. Seeing these five narrative panels, they move not only chronologically, but also geographically, each ending with a growth statement. You can see these growth statements on the timeline. Structural criticism, uh, this is sometimes called language structures. Uh, 
Uh, their understanding is that language puts together and gives expression to one's perception of reality, that everyone has a worldview, and that the speaker and writer's perception of reality has to be investigated. Human mind frames thought via a closed system of sign codes, they say, organized according to universal patterns in the brain. Now, this sounds very speculative, and in some senses it is. Language or text, they say, is how we express those universal deep patterns. These patterns make up your view of reality or worldview. And if I can just dissect those language structures, I can understand what is in the human mind of the author. But not, not at the time that he wrote, but what was behind his words. Okay, I, I can get at the patterns of his mind behind his words, not necessarily the words themselves and what they mean. So, these patterns express themselves in structure of language, which predetermines the makeup of genre and literary forms. Let me say it another way that makes it a little more clear. It's assumed there's a common pool of structures that reside in the human mind, and all people use those structures as they process and think about the world. These structures reside not only in the mind, but find expression in certain literary forms and genre. Okay, so that's kind of esoteric, isn't it? The goal is to determine the relationship between the surface structure and the actual text, the writing. And so this deep, deeper structure, implicit structure, belongs to literature, certain types of literature, and as such reveals the perception of reality. And this, and this is where there's a question mark over the validity of this. Because what they're attempting to do is understand something that's not tied to the text. It's behind the text. It's in the mind of those who use these structures in the text. So the deeper implicit structure yields a meaning that can be transported to our day. If we can understand those implicit structures, they do yield meaning, and we can take that meaning and bring it forward into our day. It sounds rather innocuous, but I, I, it's not, I don't think. The meaning that comes from the structure is not to be equated with that of the biblical author. It's not his. The meaning of the text is in the deep structure, but, uh, not the words or their meanings. Your head might be spinning now and thinking, what is he saying? Well, let me give you an example. Grant Osborne in the Hermeneutical uh, Spiral, his book, The Hermeneutical Spiral, looks at structural criticism and gives an example. It's the golden text of the Bible, John 3.16. He writes, the surface text is not, does not import, impart its meaning. Uh, rather, one must consult the entire di dialogue between Jesus and Nicodemus in verses 1 through 5. In particular, the binary codes, the deeper implicit structure, that of the above Jesus and the below Nicodemus. Then the further, further apply these to the editorial edition of verses 16 to 21 that explains what Jesus meant to Nicodemus. With its own binary codes, opposites, for example, sending and receiving, judgment and salvation, believe and reject, light and darkness, truth and evil. These symbols are then deci deciphered to discover the deep structure underlying me message. Then you can transform that, that code on the basis of codes in of our day. The background or the surface structure doesn't speak, but rather the oppositions within the text communicate meaning. These speak directly to us. So every reader goes to the text of John 3, um, chapter 3, they see these binary codes and they're able to understand the meaning that really is not tied to the words in the text, but tied to the deep structure of these binary codes. <laughs> okay, evaluation. Uh, if not, who, it, it, who would the biblical audi audience understand? What, what Would the biblical uh, author or his audience have been aware of the meanings that are derived from structural analysis. And if not, who then is creating meaning? Well, the meaning of John 3 then, according to structuralists, it is not the text, not what the author meant, not what the readers understood, original readers, but rather it's my response. Texts do not assign meaning. Texts do not think on their own. Texts are not people. People assign meaning to words that they speak or write. You know, that's, that's my critique. Uh, it, it has to be, come from the text. It can't come from those deep structures. I don't think the authors would have even recognized the meanings they derived. 
uh, the modern re reader is actually creating meaning as he em engages the text. Okay, so every mo modern reader approaching John 3 creates the meaning as he engages the binary codes. And my response is, which modern reader? Are, are all readings equally valid? If so, then the word of God has become the word of people, relativized. And there's no objective textual meaning at all. None to be found or discovered. All that's required is for you to make up your own meaning. 